Hello everyone and happy Easter. So today I am going to be giving you a beautiful Easter story here from the Christ letters. So this is Jesus's account, his account of what actually happened. So we get to know the real story, why Jesus was actually killed, what he was up to. So I'm, I'm just going to begin to read from the Christ letters here. So just uh, sit back and enjoy this beautiful Easter weekend, if that happens to be when you're listening to this story. So, reflecting on past suffering and sorrow will make you want to cry. You will feel a return of the original depression and anguish as you relive the time in your imagination. You may want to withdraw from people because your consciousness has now descended from your former state of happiness and peaceful equilibrium to experience yet again the lowered consciousness vibrations of consciousness forms you created at the initial time of your suffering. Changing moods indicates a change in your consciousness energies a lift in your consciousness vibration gives you a physical, emotional, and mental lift, making you feel happy. A drop in your consciousness energies will depress the functioning of your entire system and you will feel the onset of depression, or at the very least, a drop from the former buoyancy you were enjoying. I'm describing for you a fact of existence. I know you think this has nothing to do with the Easter story, but it does. Your entire universe manifests in different frequencies of vibration, of consciousness energy particles. As these frequencies move up and down or from one level to another, so do the visible and physical structures manifest differing levels of energy. And there is a change of mental patterns and emotions and appearance. To descend from my state of consciousness, to re-enter the conditions of my time on earth is prompted only by my love for mankind. For 2,000 years, Christians have been reliving the trauma of my crucifixion. Some people have even experienced the stigma, which is nothing more than a hysterical and morbidly emotional response to what they believe I endured. People have worked themselves up into an emotional pitch akin to frenzy while imagining the anguish of my suffering before my death. Their emotional gratitude for what I endured sends them into a state of physical distress. This is being written for you on your Good Friday, and I have come specifically to talk to you about my crucifixion and to tell you that you must abandon all the drama associated with the remembrance of this day. I died, and that was for me a wondrous release. It is time that people wake up from their long, long dream and come to understand existence as it really is and the truth concerning my crucifixion, which has been hidden till this time. On Good Fridays, year after year down the centuries, you have created a contaminated, traumatic consciousness state of being throughout the world as far removed from the spiritual dimension of universal creative consciousness as hell is removed from heaven. Now that I have chosen to relive my life on earth in the persona of Jesus through the mind of the one who is receiving my words in order to help the world move on to a new phase of spiritual mental development, I ask that those who can receive my words to give up this practice of remembering my death and exercising physical self-denial during your Lenten fast to commemorate my 40 days in the desert. As you must realize from this narrative, my time in the desert was one of great joy and blessedness of spirit. We'll do another lesson on that. Jesus came out of the desert and he was able to perform his miracles, but you were never told what happened to him in the desert. So we will do another lesson on that. 
Many events of great spiritual significance took place just prior to my death, which are excellent examples of the great cosmic laws in action within your dimension of existence. I'm now giving you a brief account of those important events since it is my purpose to enlighten your minds wholly, to give you knowledge beyond any knowledge yet received by another person in your universe. When I began to prepare my disciples for the approaching death, it was an immensely difficult task. They could scarcely contain their shock and astonishment. The thought of my being crucified as an ordinary felon was repellent beyond words, and neither did they want to lose me from their, from their midst. I had called them to follow me and leave behind lives which had been fairly prosperous. They had left their families and homes to rebuild their lives around me and my work. They had taken pride in my progress through the towns. They had been willing to be associated with me and been known as my disciples, despite the rejection and harsh criticism of their religious leaders. Furthermore, they loved and respected me, both for the way I lived my own teachings and the way I had compassionately healed so many people and brought their comfort in their unhappy lives. They truly believed I was the Son of God. How could the Son of God end up on the cross? They asked each other. Their horror increased with every question. It was unthinkable. They felt a tremendous void opening up in front of them, a void in their lives and a huge crater in the earth on which they walked and a vast expanse of instability and lack of purpose within themselves. What I told them about my future crucifixion, they dared not contemplate. Such an event would destroy everything they had believed in with all their hearts. Consequently, my disciples loudly and volubly resisted what I tried to tell them and stated again and again that such a thing could never be. When I stood firm against their stubborn denials, they were eventually forced to quiet their arguments and outwardly accept that such a thing might be possible. I told them that after my death, they would see me again and that I expected them to carry on the work that I had started. The pain and argumentativeness I had aroused in my disciples also affected me deeply. It was no easy undertaking to go to Jerusalem where my fate awaited me. More than anything, I wondered how I would measure up to this great challenge of my endurance. Would I be able to transcend the physical condition and enter into universal father consciousness and remain there until I died? At times, I was deeply frightened of the ordeal, but I dared not reveal this to my disciples. Therefore, I began my last journey towards Jerusalem with powerfully mixed feelings. On one hand, I was weary of healing and talking and teaching to people who listened with open mouths and had no real understanding of anything I was trying to tell them. I had thought that my knowledge would enable people to climb out of their misery and at the very least, make contact with the Father and gain a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven. There had been no evidence of such a spiritual awakening even amongst my disciples. My disappointment and sense of failure made me glad to be moving on from the earth to the glorious existence I knew awaited me after my death. At the same time, I wondered how I would endure the pain of the crucifixion Throughout my mission, I had lived a more or less consistently peaceful, frequently exalted state of mind, with my thoughts focused on the Father Love Consciousness, author of all being, knowing that I had to but ask, and what I asked for would swiftly manifest itself. Would I be able to keep my equanimity when brought before the Council, when led out to my crucifixion, when nailed to the cross with the weight of my with the weight hanging from my hands because i was now giving way to doubts and fears the normal level of my consciousness frequencies were dropping 
They were taking me down into the frequencies of the earthly plane consciousness. I became prey again to my old aggression, prompting me to unreasonable actions I would have never contemplated earlier when in my former state of total harmony with the Father Love Consciousness. My doubts and conflicts externalized in my life as human emotions and impulses which contravened the cosmic laws of love. First, there was the episode of the fig tree. I was hungry and went to the tree not really expecting to find fruit because it was not the right season for figs. When my search was unfruitful, I cursed the fig tree. 24 hours later, it shriveled to its roots. It was a shocking experience. It was the first time my words had caused harm to anything. However, it clearly demonstrated for my disciples the power of thought for good and evil. It showed them that the more spiritually evolved a person is, the greater the impact of their words on the environment. I took the opportunity to point out to my disciples that I had thoughtlessly behaved as does the average man or woman who, when having high expectations, cannot get what they want. They usually react with anger, tears, hostility, or even sharp words, words which might or might not amount to the kind of ill-wishing or cursing of the person who has denied them their heart's desire. They had now seen for themselves what my cursing had done to the fig tree. They should now be able to understand that while a strong conviction would bring about anything they might desire and imagine, they must also be constantly aware of their own mental, emotional conditioning. They must not harbor resentment against others, but must swiftly forgive. Otherwise, they could do much damage to those they resented, which damage would return to them in due course as a harvest of their own sowing. Furthermore, as one sows, so does one reap. I knew that what I had done to the fig tree would inevitably return to me in one form or another. I took my disciples to the temple. It was many years since I'd been there, and I knew my visit would serve to set in motion a train of events which would lead to my crucifixion. Some of the people recognized me, and in response to their requests, I began to teach them. More people gathered and crowded the moneylenders who began to complain. Their shouting and loud complaints broke my train of thought as I was teaching. Suddenly, my wrath was aroused. Here were people earnestly gathered around me, wanting to hear the words of life, which soon I would not be able to speak to them. And there were the moneylenders who made their living by selling livestock for sacrifices, which did the people no good whatsoever. These men only brought people into debt and misery. I felt a rush of blood in my head, and I pushed over the tables, scattering their money, and I drove the money-hearted men out of the temple. Now, there was a great commotion of shouting and screaming. Some people were scrambling to pick up the money. The money lenders were calling down curses on my head, denouncing me as evil, as the one doing the work of Beelzebub and a thousand other devils. The priests and Pharisees all came, and all the people who were set great. The priests and Pharisees and all the people who set great store by the sacrifices in the temple came running together to find out the cause of the noise and confusion. On hearing the moneylender's story, they were so outraged by my actions, they launched into vociferous condemnation of me and lamentations to impress the priests, each one making louder protests than their neighbor to demonstrate their horror at what I had done. Such a thing had never been seen in the temple before. Pausing for a minute. Now, Jesus was outraged with the sacrifices. He knew he had always been 
outraged at the sacrifices and the ridicul ridiculousness of them that you would sacrifice something else to atone for your own sinning. And on top of that, these poor people who are already suffering, who are already suffering enough, the church then threatened hell and damnation on these people if they didn't pay for these sacrifices. Which if you think about that for a moment, then this means that if you were rich and you had a lot of money, then you could afford many sacrifices and you could sin all that you wanted to and have that sin atoned by killing something else, something else, beautiful creation that was meant to enjoy life as you were meant to enjoy life. Jesus knew how illogical and ridiculous this was, so this is why it set him on fire. Now, even those who had previously listened to me were now disturbed at my willfulness and wondered what kind of a man I might be. They were standing close together, watching the proceedings, when they were noticed and approached by the priests and Pharisees, who persuaded them that I was trying to destroy all that they believed in, preaching a false god, entirely unlike anything they had ever heard about in their synagogues. The priests passed on their own outraged anger to the people and convinced them that my sin would contaminate them also if they persisted in listening to my madness. Gradually, the people were persuaded I was an evil influence and I should be removed before I could disrupt the peace of the country and bring down the wrath of the Roman governor on the entire country of Palestine. My disciples, ashamed of what I had done, quietly left the scene and hid amongst the alleys some way from the temple. When they returned to me later, they clearly showed they were sorely tried by my actions. They wondered whether I had taken leave of my senses, gone mad, prophesying and doing those very things which would probably be the cause of it. It was at that time Judas, who had never fully shed his Jewish beliefs, began to doubt whether I was the Messiah after all. Three years I had taught the people, and there was no lessening of the Roman rule. Three years and people were no nearer the happiness I had promised them. And now it seemed that I was about to become a disturber of the peace, bringing down the wrath of Rome on their heads. He heard that the Jewish high priest wanted to get rid of me and so he offered his services to identify my person when required to do so. When it was time for me to eat the Passover with my disciples, I arranged we should eat it all together in a large supper room. I knew it would be the last time I would eat any food on earth. I do not want to return deeply to the consciousness of that night. I felt a great sadness to be leaving my disciples who had served me so well. With my sadness came a return of all my fears and conflicts. I had moments of deep emotional self-pity. I felt that no one understood all I had tried to do for my people and the sacrifice I was prepared to make for them. John was giving a vivid account of the story of the Israelites last night in Egypt before they escaped in the desert. He spoke of Moses' instructions to the head of each family to kill an unblemished lamb, to cook it in a certain way, and to paint its blood on the doorposts of all the Israelite dwellings, because that very night, angels would come and slaughter all the firstborn children of the Egyptians and their livestock. With great relish, he recalled the outcry made by the Egyptians when they woke to find the bloodied firstborn in every home. No one was spared. It was the kind of horrible story I rejected as having no value for anyone speak, seeking any higher spiritual truth. I wondered how much my disciples had really understood when I spoke of their heavenly father and his love for all of mankind. How could they relish the thought of angels killing the Egyptian firstborn when I had clearly told them that God, the father, was love? But the Jews 
had always been preoccupied with the shedding of blood to atone for their sins. Even Abraham, the founder of the Israelite nation, had been convinced he should take his only son in the desert and kill and offer him as a sacrifice to God, a pagan and revolting thought. I thought of the animal sacrifices in the temple. Loving all of the wild things in creation as I did, the practice was an abomination to me. And now I was about to be put to death because I had dared speak the words of truth and when I considered how little I had achieved in passing on my knowledge, I wondered why I had been sent on such a mission. I felt a momentary spasm of resentment and anger in threading my usual feelings of love for these men. With some cynicism, I wondered what effect effective token of remembrance I could leave with them to bring back their minds to all my teachings when I was no longer with them. If they could swiftly forget all my teachings on the Father's love and enjoy the horrible story of the Passover while I was still in the room with them, how much would they remember when I had died as a felon on the cross, the most despicable of deaths? Then it came to me that since they were so moved by the shedding of blood, I would give them my blood to remember me by. With these ironical and reflections, I took up a loaf of bread, broke it, and passed it to my disciples and told them to eat it. I likened the brokenness of the bread to the future brokenness of my body and asked them to repeat this breaking of the bread and distribution as a means of remembering the sacrifice of my body to bring them the truth, the truth about God and the truth about life and the truth about love. Realizing I was in a strange mood, they stopped eating, listened, took the bread, and ate it silently. Next, I took up my goblet of wine and passed it around, saying that they must each drink from it, for it was the symbol of my blood, which would shortly be shed because I had dared to bring them the truth of existence. I saw that the edge in my voice had reached some of them, soberly. Each one took a sip and then passed the goblet to his neighbor, but still they said nothing. They sensed I was in earnest and would not tolerate any more argument. Then I told them that a certain man amongst them would betray me. Privately, I understood his motives and knew he was a necessary part of the future sequence of events. He was but playing a role which his nature had prompted him to do. I knew that he would suffer greatly and I felt compassion for him, but these thoughts I kept, I kept to myself. When I mentioned that one of them would betray me and told Judas to leave and do what he had to do quickly, the disciples came alive, wondering if this really was their last meal with me. Now there was a great deal of emotional distress, questions, and even recrimations for having led them into such a trap. Again, they wondered what they would do with their lives after I had gone. They asked what kind of standing they would have in the community if I were crucified. They would be an object of derision, they argued. No one would ever again believe a word that they spoke. Deeply saddened by their self-centered response to my predicament, I assured them that they had no need to fear for their own safety. They would abandon me and would not be connected to my crucifixion. After my death, I suggested they should disperse and return to Galilee. This touched Peter deeply and he reacted, vehemently denying that he would ever abandon me. But of course, he did. All the love that I had for my fellow men, all that I had longed to accomplish for them in this moment of my own need, still met with blank, non-comprehension, even resistance. Their only concern was what would happen to them. There was no words of kindness, offering of help, anguish for my future ordeal. How hard was the human heart, I thought. How many weary centuries would pass before mankind would be able to move beyond their own hurt and pain to feel a, even a gl glimmer of love and compassion for other unfortunates 
in a worse situation than themselves. And so, although deeply disappointed, even hurt, by their selfish reactions, I also understood them and attempted to give my disciples courage to face the future and assured them that I would always be with them, even when I was hidden from their sight. The work I had started would be promoted from the life beyond. I would not leave them alone. They would know and feel my presence, and this would be a comfort to them. I told them to cling to their memories of my time with them. I warned that there would be many who would continue in the knowledge that I had given them, but there would be outsiders who would seek to add the voice of tradition and reason to my teachings. My words would be so distorted that eventually they would no longer reveal the original truth I had brought to the world. When I told them that this would happen, they were upset, even panic-stricken. I was relieved to see that my teachings had not been in vain after all. They had not entered totally deaf ears. They asked me to tell them more, but I raised my hand and said that was all I could say. At this point, I felt I had said all I ever wanted to say while on earth, that my speech with the men had been accomplished. All I greatly deeply desired was to retreat into silence and find peace and comfort in my contact with the Father. We left the supper room and walked to the Mount of Olives, but the mood of my disciples was one of inner conflict, fear, and doubt. Most of them left to join their families and friends who would still be celebrating their own Passover. In the garden, there was a special boulder shaped like a little cave. I like to shelter in it from the wind. And so I sat and meditated and prayed, seeking a way into the exalted harmony I had enjoyed in the past. I knew that when I moved into attunement with the Father love, my fears would dissolve and I would be in a state of total and absolute peaceful confidence again. As I felt the power of love move into me and possess my human consciousness, so did the strength to endure what lay ahead possess my heart. I would be able to remain within the love and give the love to the others till the very end. And so it was. I will not even attempt to re-enter into the trial and crucifixion state. It is of no consequence. When I finally died on the cross and my spirit withdrew from my tortured body, I was lifted into ineffable and radiant light. I was enclosed in the warmth and comfort of love such as I had never experienced before. I had a sensation of enveloping praise and powerful assurance of a work well done, of ecstasy and universal strength to continue the work, and joy and rapture which is far beyond any that the earthly condition can ever know. I moved into a new and wondrously beautiful way of life, but I still descended in consciousness to remain in touch with the people I had left behind. I was able to show myself to those who were sufficiently sensitive to be able to see me. However, the story of Thomas who supposedly fingered my wounds is nonsense. My disciples did not know that I had secretly arranged with Joseph of Arimathea to take my body to his own unused tomb after my death, where he would anoint it according to custom before the sun set. Then, when darkness had fallen, and the Sabbath was being observed by everyone in Jerusalem. Assisted by two mounted, trustworthy servants, he would take my body secretly during the night and by out-of-sight tracks during the day to a mountainside outside of Nazareth in Galilee. There, further assisted by my family, if he followed my directions, he would find a small, hidden cave which had given me shelter from storms and a refuge from people when I was young, unhappy, and rebellious, and at odds with the world. Joseph promised to find the cave from a map I had given him, and to leave me there after further embalming. He would build up the small entrance to thoroughly block it from intruders. There, my body has rested, free from molestation. It has been said of me that my body rose from the dead. What an absurdity! 
conjured up by earthly minds which were at a loss to satisfactory explain my death as a felon on the cross. What need would I have of an earthly body to continue existence in the next dimension? How could such a ridiculous myth persist even into the 21st century? It had been it has been a measure of the lack of understanding of Christians that they have blindly accepted such a dogma to this very time. Think about this carefully. Having been released from an earthly body, and after my experience of the ecstasy and glorious rapture of passing into a higher dimension of universal consciousness, why would I want to return to the earthly dimension to enter my body again. Of what use would that be to me in your world or in mine? While the physical substance of my body might be spiritualized when perfectly attuned to the father love consciousness, while I still lived on earth, would not my body be an encumbrance and a deterrent to my subsequent journeys within the highest spiritual kingdoms? Visible things are but a manifestation of specific frequencies of vibration in consciousness, which produce a shimmer of motes or particles, giving an appearance of solid matter. Each visible substance possesses its own unique vibrational frequency. A change in the rate of vibration produces a change in the appearance of matter. A consciousness energies, as consciousness energies change, so does the appearance of matter change. Therefore, it was possible for me to focus and lower my frequencies of consciousness to that point where my form became visible to the human eye. I could return to my disciples and be seen by them, and I did so. I love them more than ever before, and I owed them as much comfort and support as I was able to give to them after my death. Not only this, it was necessary to direct my own power into their minds in order to give them the impetus and courage to continue the work I had started. However, I want you to know that the individualized consciousness which has ascended in vibrational frequencies to the very portals of universal creative dimension becomes light individualized. An individualized consciousness which needs no body in which to express and enjoy all the glorious consciousness can devise in the highest spiritual realms. It is a supreme and enraptured state of being having none of the needs, desires, impulses experienced by those who have not fully mounted beyond, high beyond, and above the ego. While living on earth, your minds remained anchored within certain parameters of vibrational frequencies, imprisoned in bodies which have their own needs. If your consciousness were truly to soar beyond these parameters, your earthly self would disappear. When I was trapped in a body, I was also largely confined to these parameters of vibrational frequencies and consciousness. Furthermore, imagination alone can soar no further than your previous experiences, and therefore you are confined to your past, which you project into your future. However, little by little, you will be led by those minds which are sensitive enough to access the higher spiritual dimensions and can thus move beyond your present consciousness boundaries. They will recall those wondrous experiences and states beyond your own to which you yourselves will then be able to aspire. In this way, you go forwards in levels or steps of spiritual development. Each step brings you a higher vision of what can be achieved, and out of this vision you formulate a new goal. With this goal ever before you, you work to cleanse yourself of the contaminating influence of the bonding rejection impulses of your earthly existence 
step by step, you transcend your ego. When you transcend your ego and it dies within your consciousness, you are now abundantly alive within the Father Love Consciousness and find the reality of the Kingdom of Heaven in your lives, within yourself, and within your environment. This is why I created the Mental Cleanse series completely free for you so that you can cleanse your mind of all of the bonding rejections that are keeping you from being in the flow of that divine consciousness. So you can check that out. It's called the Mental Cleanse series. It is on my channel here. I hope that you guys have the most wonderful Easter. This is what the book looks like. It is free. You can download this for free online, The Christ Letters. Download it for free. You can listen to it for free on YouTube. It is through this book, through my study of these letters, uh, through my meditations, and through the cleansing that I have gone over um, the past several years, cleansing, this mental cleansing process that I was able to experience everything that Jesus talks about in this book and having my own enlightening experience, which is why I am so passionate about sharing this with you so that we all can have this same experience and that we can create a world of peace and that we can know Christ's true message. So stay tuned. You can check out. I have other spiritual lessons and there are plenty more to come. I hope you all have the most wonderful Easter and thank you so much for staying tuned. Don't forget to check out the free books that are there online. Download it, listen to it. It really will change your life and it will make the things that you have wondered about make so much more sense to you. Have a absolutely blessed day whenever you happen to be watching this and I will see you in the next video.